Well, I've been struggling with a cold all week long, so I think I can talk. Um, Dan has come prepared as a backup in case my voice gives out on me here. Um, he's going to switch topics and sw- preach a different sermon. But anyway, we'll see how this goes. Anyway, pray for me. By the way, Happy New Year. Um, it's another year, another decade to start our walk with God, and um, it's going to be good, even though it started off with a sickness for, with me. Um, it's going to be good. God's going to give us some amazing things. Our topic today, what are you doing here? That night, Elijah was drained of energy. The day had been both emotionally and physically exhausting. There had been that long hike up Mount Carmel in the morning, the diligent watching all day long as the 850 priests of Baal and Asheroth made a frenzied attempt to contact their gods that could never hear their cries, then attempted to sneak fire onto that altar. There had been no time for eating. His adrenaline had run high as fire had flashed down from heaven, burning up not only the drenched and saturated offering, but the stones and the water in the ditch around the altar. There had been a powerful emotional high when the nation bowed and acknowledged Jehovah as the true God. The cries of the people shouting, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The crowds dragging the prophets of Baal to the bottom of the mountain to the Kishon Valley where they were slaughtered coming back up the mountain to pray for rain, pleading with God for rain even when there was no signs that his prayers were being heard. Then the excitement of seeing it begin to rain for the very first time in three and a half years. And then a marathon run on muddy, slippery roads in front of Ahab's horses. Coming off the pinnacle of faith, he was mentally exhausted Running down from the pinnacle of Mount Carmel down to Jezreel, he was physically exhausted. And as they had come to Jezreel, he had stayed outside the city and laid down out of the pouring rain to sleep. In his exhausted condition, he was suddenly awakened by a messenger. Jezebel has threatened your life. She said that by tonight, you will be as dead as the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Elijah wasn't thinking clearly. The blackness of the night the rain pouring, the lightning flashing, the thunder rolling. He's awakened from a sound sleep and now facing a death threat, he panicked. I've got to run for my life. 1 Kings 19 tells the story. I'd just invite you to to turn in your Bibles to that and we're going to follow it through. 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Whether you look it up on your Bibles that you brought on your phones, however it is, please follow along. 1 Kings 19, verse 3 and 4. The Bible says Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Just a concept where where Beersheba was, remember? Elijah was from the nation of Israel, which was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. He had run all the way through Israel, all the way down through Judah, He was now, Beersheba was the very southernmost town in the land of Judah. He had gone completely to the edge of the kingdom of Judah. And then he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. Can you imagine just a a day or two after this high experience where fire had come down from heaven and he prays, God, I've had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. He should have had faith, but he didn't. He should have trusted in God, but he was filled with fear. He shouldn't have run, but he did. And running south, out of the kingdom of Israel, down into Judah, out of the kingdom of Judah, saw through the land until he reaches the border of the country. And there he leaves his servant and he journeys into the desert, leaving God's people discouraged with the church, feeling there was no hope at all. And there in the wilderness, feeling depressed, exhausted, no energy left, his emotions overwhelming him, feeling that his life might be taken at any moment, He prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. 
the question is asked in, in the book Prophets and Kings. Did God forsake Elijah in his hour of trial? Oh no. He loved his servant no less when Elijah felt himself forsaken of God and man than when in answer to his prayer, fire flashed from heaven and illuminated the mountaintop. And I don't know if you caught that, so I'm going to say it again. But it says, God loved Elijah just as much when he was discouraged and he was out in that wilderness all alone as he did when he was on the mountaintop. And you know, God loves you just as much when you're going through trials and discouragement and disappointments as he does when you're high and you're spiritually on an uplift and everything's going great. God loved his servant no less. When Elijah felt himself forsaken of God, Elijah felt like God had forsaken him, but God hadn't forsaken him. As when, in answer to his prayer, fire flashed from heaven and illuminated the mountaintop. And God sent an angel to sustain and comfort him. God had not forgotten him. Verse 5 says, or in 1 Kings 19, verse 5, Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then lay down again. Boy, he needed physical nourishment. He needed encouragement. He had been running for days with literally nothing to eat during that time. And now God had provided bread and water. And he lay down and he went to sleep. We don't know how long he slept. But verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat. The journey is too much for you. And so he got up and ate and drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights. That's some kind of food. We talk about energy bars. Um, 40 days and 40 nights of energy with one meal. Well, two meals, I guess. Until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. Another name for Horeb, Mount Horeb, is Mount Sinai. He made it to Mount Sinai. In his desperation, not knowing where to go, he still had the instinctive sense that he must go to where he knew God had been. In the strength that God gave, Elijah made his way to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the very same mountain where Moses had met God at the burning bush, where God had come to Moses and said, I want you to go and and tell Pharaoh, let my people go, that they might serve me. It was after God had sent the plagues on Egypt, and Israel had come out of the slavery and into the wilderness, that they came to that very same mountain where Moses had met God at the burning bush. And it was there that God himself met with the children of Israel and gave the Ten Commandments. Elijah knew that Mount Sinai was a holy place, a place, the mountain of God, the Bible calls it. Mount Sinai is where miracles had happened in the history of God's people. And Elijah knew that if he was in trouble, he needed to go back to where he knew God had been. If there's any hope, it's in God. And you know, when things get bad in your life and you say, man, I don't know what to do. Think back on those times when you say, I know God was there. I know he watched over me in that situation. He hasn't forgotten me. He is the same today as he was back then. If there's any hope, it's in God. 1 Kings 19 verse 9 says, Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? The question was not for God's information. When God asks a question, it is not because he does not know the answer. God knows everything. But it's like when God called to Adam, Adam, where are you? It wasn't that God didn't know where Adam was. It's that Adam needed to realize where he was. When God asked Cain, where's your brother Abel? It wasn't that God didn't know what had happened to Abel. But Cain needed to realize what he had done. When God asks a question, it isn't because he needs to know the answer. It's because we need to know the answer. Why are we, what are we doing? And God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? We're told not until Elijah had learned to trust wholly in God could he complete his work for those who had been seduced into Baal worship. 
The signal triumph on the heights of Carmel had opened the way for still greater victories, yet from the wonderful opportunities opening before him, Elijah had been turned away by the threat of Jezebel. The man of God must be made to understand the weakness of his present position as compared with the vantage ground that the Lord would have him occupy. God had bigger things planned for Elijah. He had better opportunities awaiting. God wanted him to be even stronger. God had not given up on Elijah. And so God met his servant with the inquiry, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Is this where I asked you to be? I sent you to the book Kareth. And then to the widow of Zarephath, I commissioned you to return to Israel and to stand before the idolatrous priests on Mount Carmel. I gave you the strength to guide the chariot of King Ahab to the gate of Jezreel. But who sent you on this hasty flight into the wilderness? What errand do you have that you're doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Have you ever been put in the position of explaining to God why you're living out of his will? I've been there. It's really, really hard. It's hard to even explain to people why you're doing the stupid things that you're doing. And they say, why are you doing this? You say, I don't know. And when God asks the question, what are you doing? I didn't ask you to be here. I never asked you to come down here. I, I had a mission for you. You were doing my will up there where you were, but you ran away. Why are you do, down here? And when God's asking the question, you better be careful how you answer And you know, Elijah gave a self-justifying answer. He said, God, there's nothing wrong with me. The problem was with the church. The problem was with your people. They're all as corrupt as could be. God, I tell you, if you only knew what I have been going through, you'd understand why I'm here. Circumstances have overwhelmed me. And of course, God did know what he'd been going through, as God had been there all the time. But look at Elijah's answer. When God asked, what are you doing here? Look at his answer. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. I've done everything. Done everything you asked me to do. I've served you faithfully. But the Israelites, notice he's putting the blame on someone else as we always do when we're in trouble. Um, Look at what they're doing. They have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Poor me. I'm the only one that stands up for God. And they're going to kill me. And then there's going to be nobody left. There's not going to be any worshipers of God left in this world. You can almost hear the bitterness and the frustration and the despair in his voice. I have every right to do what I've done and to be where I am. I've done the right thing. And the church is always doing the wrong thing. I've done everything that I could for you. I've worked my heart out for you, God. I poured out my life and used up my strength to stand up for you. When no one else would stand up for you on Mount Carmel, I stood up. But the church has persisted in doing the wrong thing. They've rejected you. They've, they're not teaching the truth. They're not obeying you. They're worshiping idols. They destroyed those who would preach the word of God. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to destroy me too. From Elijah's viewpoint, the only thing he could do was run. He felt that the only thing he could do was to put it all behind him, to run away and leave Israel to their own consequences. But God still had a revelation for Elijah. Verse 11 says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. What a statement that would be. Elijah, I want you to go out and stand out here because I'm going to come by. I'm going to show myself to you. Elijah, please come out of your cave. I'm about to reveal myself to you. I'm going to pass by. And Elijah's mind must have raced back to that time and day in the time of Moses, where on that very same mountain, Moses had pled with God, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see you. The very same thing that God had just told Elijah he was going to do for him. Moses had asked to see God and and said, God, show me your glory. And God had said, listen, I'll show you my goodness, but you can't see my face because if you saw me, you would die. I am so powerful and so righteous and so holy that no one may see me and live. And God had let Moses see, (coughs) excuse me, the backside of him. 
but could not see his face. And Moses, or I'm sorry, Elijah, made his way out to the mouth of that cave, waiting for God to reveal himself. No doubt wondering what incredible manifestation of God he would see. What fantastic thing would happen. Some demonstration that would be more powerful than shutting up the windows of heaven so that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. <coughs> Excuse me. Something more dramatic than having a container of flour and a bottle of oil never run out during the famine. Something more dramatic than fire coming down from heaven that not only burned up the sacrifice, but the stones and the water. Elijah was looking for a powerful demonstration of the presence of God. In verse 11, it says, Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. That wind... With the rocks shattering, no doubt tornado force winds. When it says rocks are breaking apart, you know the wind's blowing pretty hard when rocks are breaking apart. And Elijah was buffeted about, <coughs> excuse me, and he no doubt ran into the cave where he cowered as rocks careened down the mountainside. But the Bible says, but God was not in the wind. The Bible goes on to say, after the wind, there was an earthquake. Everything that supported Elijah was shaken. No footing was safe. The very foundations were unstable. The one thing, the firm ground that he stood on, that he thought he could depend on, was collapsing around him. And no doubt Elijah ran out of the cave now, fearing that it would collapse in on him. The place you don't want to be in an earthquake is in a cave where the thing's going to collapse and trap you in there. But now the boulders were coming down the mountain. There was no... No place of safety. Reminded when I was a young boy, we were out camping in Montana. And it was August 17, 1959, six years old. And we had a huge earthquake. It was magnified, magnitude 7.5. And it caused an 80 million ton landslide that came down across the Madison River. Killed 28 people who were camping in the area. We were about 40 miles away from, from where this happened. <coughs> Excuse me dammed up the river and made a, a huge lake. But <coughs> earthquakes are scary things. And the ground is moving and rocks are coming down and there's no place of safety. He's not safe in the cave. It's going to collapse on him. He's not safe where there isn't a cave because the rocks are, are sliding down the mountainside. Thank you. But the Bible says, we're still in verse 11, after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. A fire intense in his fury burned up everything around him. The little vegetation that existed in the wilderness was gone. The little bit of life that had been left around him was scorched. It reminds me, by the way, right now they're having wildfires in Australia where literally 12 and a half million acres have been burned, 17 people killed so far. I saw last night they said over 500 million animals have died in that forest fire. 500 million animals um, killed. November 2018, you remember here in the U.S., Paradise, California, in just a few hours, a fire swept through that valley. The entire city burned to the ground with 85 civilian casualties destroyed 18,804 structures. Fires devastating. This fire just burned up everything around. And Elijah, no doubt, ran back into the cave for, for protection against the intense heat. But God wasn't in the fire. The wind, the earthquake, and the fire. His world's unstable. It's unpredictable. It's unfriendly. It's hostile. It won't support life. It seems as though it's impossible to live there where Elijah is. The wind tearing things apart, the earthquake shaking everything, the fire burning up everything that's left. But the Bible says that those powerful demonstrations were not a revelation of God. And verse 12 says, After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. After all this chaos and this burning, the turmoil and the shaking, 
there's a gentle whisper. I'm going to reveal myself to you, Elijah. Not in some dramatic way, but in some gentle, quiet way. A still, small voice. In Prophets and Kings, we read, Not in mighty manifestations of divine power, but by a still, small voice, did God choose to reveal himself to his servant. He desired to teach Elijah that it's not always the work that makes the greatest demonstration that's the most successful in accomplishing his purpose. While Elijah waited for the revelation of the Lord, a tempest rolled, the lightnings flashed, a devouring fire swept by, but God was not in all this. And then there came a still, small voice, and the prophet covered his head before the presence of the Lord. His petulance was silenced, his spirit softened and subdued. He now knew that a quiet trust, a firm reliance on God, would ever find for him a present help in time of need. It's not always the most learned presentations of God's truth that convicts and converts the soul. It's not by eloquence or logic that men's hearts are reached, but by the sweet influences of the Holy Spirit, which operate quietly and yet surely in transforming and developing character. It's the still, small voice of the Spirit of God that has power to change the heart. Verse 12 says, After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, And after the fire came a gentle whisper, that still small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? The very same question God had asked him, the very identical question. What are you doing here? This isn't where I asked you to be. And amazingly enough, Elijah gives the exact same answer word for word. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. But the Israelites have rejected your covenant and they've torn down your altars and they put your prophets to death with the sword and I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. The same answer. This time God had a, some counsel for him. The Lord said to, to him, go back the way you came. You came down here. You never asked me if you ought to come here. Go back to where you were. That's where I wanted you. Go back the same way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Aram was not God's people. Aram was Syria. Matter of fact, Syria was an enemy of God's people. And he tells Elijah, go and anoint the king of Syria. And then anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And so... This was, right in place of Ahab, Jehu was going to be the one who succeeded Ahab, that evil king. Um, And then he says, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Elijah, go back the way you came, from south of Judah in the wilderness, back to the border of Judah, up through Judah, into Israel, and all the way through Israel and up into Syria. Elijah, there's wrong in the church in Israel. I know about it, and I intend to take care of it. I'll punish the wrongdoers in Israel, but I've chosen men to fulfill the divine purpose and the punishment of that idolatrous kingdom. There's stern work to be done that all might be given an opportunity to take their position on the side of the true God. But Elijah, I want you to return to Israel. I want you to go back into the church and share with others the burden of reformation. Well, and Elijah, that part about you being the only one, I have 7,000 other people in the church who are faithful to me also. They've never given in to idolatry. They've never turned from the path of obedience. Verse 18, God said to him, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bound down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, the one who would succeed him, succeed him as a prophet. But the best days were still ahead of him. Elijah still had work to do. Elijah still had confrontations with evil to make. Elijah still had a work to do for God. Ultimately, of course, he's going to be translated to heaven without seeing death. It's amazing. God, his best days were still ahead. He says, just let me die. God says, listen, you don't know. I haven't even started with you yet. I've got a lot for you to do. 
Well, there's lessons for today. We're living in a Christian world today that's as far away from God as the worshipers of Baal are. The humans exalted above the divine. Popular teachers and leaders are praised. So-called science is placed above the teachings of the Bible. If you believe in a literal creation, people think you're crazy. Many are substituting the theories of men for the word of God. Many teach that human reason should be exalted above the teachings of God's word. And it's even declared in the pulpits of the land that the law of God, the divine standard of righteousness, has been done away with. Society proclaims there is no God, that whatever perversion society agrees with at the moment is what must now be accepted. And Prophets and Kings, page 171, says, Yet this apostasy, widespread as it has come to be, is not universal. Not everyone in the world is lawless and sinful. Not everyone has taken sides with the enemy. God has many thousands who have not bowed the knee to Baal, many who long to understand more fully in regard to Christ and the law, many who are hoping against hope that Jesus will come soon to end the reign of sin and death. And there are many more who have been worshiping Baal ignorantly, but with whom the Spirit of God is still striving. Much depends on the unceasing activity of those who are true and loyal. And for this reason, Satan puts forth every possible effort to thwart the divine purpose to be wrought out through the obedient. He causes some to lose sight of their high and holy mission and to become satisfied with the pleasures of this life. He leads them to settle down at ease or for the sake of greater worldly advantages to remove from places where they might be a power for good. Others he causes to flee in discouragement from duty because of opposition or persecution. But all such are regarded by heaven with the tenderest pity. To every child of God whose voice the enemy of souls has succeeded in silencing, the question is addressed, what are you doing here? I commissioned you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to prepare a people for the day of the Lord. Why are you here? Who sent you? Many times we find ourselves in times of discouragement and disappointment and despair. Some people want to give up on life or at least on their job, or their marriage, or their school, or their church. We become critical and focus on the faults of others. Look at how bad, look at what they're doing. Look at all the advantages we have, and look at how people are turning away from God. We lose sight of what God wants us to be doing. We withdraw from what we know we should be doing, and we feel all alone and isolated. But like Elijah, has God forgotten us or forsaken us? No. God comes not with a great demonstration of power, but in a still small voice and appeals to us. What are you doing here? Are you in the center of my will? Are you doing what I asked you to do? Are you where I put you? Are you working to build up my church? And God reminds us, as he reminded Elijah, you're not the only one. You might think that you're the only one that cares. You might think you're the only one that it matters to. But it's not as bad as you feel that it is. There are other followers of mine in the church. They are true disciples and they can be trusted. Go to work and do your part in bringing the church into a right relationship with God. And there are other people that I will use also to work with you to help the church grow and bring it to decision. And God encourages us, the work is mine. Don't become discouraged when you look at the situation. God says, I'm big enough to take care of the situation. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he said, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And, you know, it takes the the pressure off of it. It's God's church. It's God's work. And our task is to make sure we stay in the center of his will, doing whatever it is that he's asked us to do. And, you know, if we do that the same way as Elijah's brightest and best days are, are ahead of him, the brightest days of our church are still ahead of us. Our brightest days of being a Christian, of our experience with God, are still great. We have great opportunities ahead of us if we will only trust Him, if we'll only do what He asks us to do and stay where He asks us to be. It's a hymn of response. I'm going to ask us to stand.